With us now, national health authorities are expected to receive a full report on the controversial developments involving Limpopo Health MEC Dr. Bobi Ramatuba. She was filmed chastising a Zimbabwean patient on the impact of foreign nationals on a public health care. But South Africa is not innocent in the creation of this problem. The country's quiet diplomacy policy repeatedly protected Zimbabwe's leaders instead of directly confronting Zimbabwe. Let's talk to African politics professor, that's Gyele Bukhamapunye. Professor, good morning and thank you very much for your time. There's honestly another conversation that has been sparked by that dehumanizing incident at the hospital. Is the conversation around government's commitment to the approach of quiet diplomacy in relation to Zimbabwe's government? They're still being accused of corruption, suppressing the media and other human rights violations. Is government's approach honestly still adequate for these kind of times we live under? Mfundo, the issue around the relations between Zimbabwe and South Africa obviously have to be looked at within the context of the SADC region, not just a bilateral relationship between the two countries, because the issues that we are talking about, including that incident that you have just referred to between the MEC and the patient from Zimbabwe, is actually a manifestation of the relationships among the countries of, the, of Southern Africa. So this issue around quiet diplomacy the so-called quiet diplomacy, because for me, diplomacy is diplomacy. Uh, there are some things that will be said in public uh, between countries among governments and so on, but there are, most of the things will be said uh, behind the scenes. So in my view, the issue here is around uh, dealing with the difficult issues uh, in terms of migration between Zimbabwe and South Africa, mm. and of course, other Southern South, South countries, and also confronting the issue around democracy, elections, governance, good governance, and uh, how citizens are supposed to be you know, treated by their governments. Because if they are ill-treated or if they are oppressed or beaten up or brutalized and so on, citizens by nature will, will leave and they'll go to other you know, areas where such oppression, such brutality is not being faced. Mm -hmm. So if Zimbabweans believe that there are issues that they have to run away from uh, in terms of good governance in their government, obviously these are the issues that the South African government has got to engage with uh, you know, the Zimbabwean authorities through the bilateral uh, uh, BNCs, these are bi binational commissions that are normally held from time to time, also through multilateral fora such as SADC. Mm -hmm. So what has been the challenge at this point to converge as leaders in the SADC region and have that conversation around migration and the collapsing economies that lead to a number of people leaving their countries? Why is it such a difficult conversation to have at that level of leadership? It is very difficult because of the historical ties uh, between the two countries, if you can just focus on Zimbabwe and South Africa. The two countries we know before 1994, uh, South Africans ran away. Most of the, uh, you know, um, uh, the people who were anti-apartheid activists uh, into countries like Zimbabwe, obviously, you know, um, uh, fearing and running away from retribution and uh, torture from the apartheid government. And then after 1994, uh, when South Africa, you know, gained its, uh, you know, um, um, uh, democracy, uh, most of the uh, restrictions that were, you know, imposed and the oppressive mechanisms were, uh, you know, by the by the government of South Africa, obviously, were, were removed. Hence, this allowed a free movement between and among different countries uh, in the region. However, the biggest problem, I think is the um, free for all that was allowed. In other words, South Africa did not look at ways and means through which to control who comes into the country, make sure that they come in, they've got documentation and everything, just like was, it was happening previously, you know, and under previous uh, governments. So therein lies the problem of not confronting the issue. However, apart from that, it is also that the, the inability of, you know, the two governments to actually sit down to say, we've got the problem here. Most of our citizens are crossing the border, going to the other side. What do we do? Who can we, uh, you know, engage the, you know, bilateral health departments in the two countries and to see who actually is going to be footing the bill that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the MEC Popi Ramatuba Ram was talking about. It is a much more higher level discussion that is supposed to be had, not just between MECs of health on both sides, of ministers of health on both sides, but between the two countries in my view. Mm -hmm. So then does that mean that government, particularly those that are senior, 
ha are equally to blame for the insults that are now being hurled at others on social media who condemn the conduct of the MEC. Could we say that they're equally to blame for what we're seeing? This level of polarization is honestly unhealthy because South Africans are fighting each other now over this situation because they're uncomfortable to have two conversations that you can condemn the conduct and still appreciate that we do have limited resources. You talk about um, you know the two governments being to blame. To a large extent, the citizens of both countries will blame you know their respective citizens. The citizens of Zimbabwe will obviously blame their government for not upholding you know good, uh, you know good governance, human rights, democracy, and so on. We know what normally happens. I mean, the last election of uh, um, the previous elections of 2000 and the elections of 2013 and, and pre uh, previous elections, whereby citizens are being forced to vote for a party and being beaten. Up. If you have situations such as those and, uh, you know, uh, uh, trampling of human rights, obviously citizens of Zimbabwe will not be happy, the majority, about what their government is doing, which forces them to leave their countries and uh, to um, emigrate elsewhere, not only to South Africa. Similarly, in South Africa, you will have a situation whereby the labor movements, COSATU and the others, they've been, you know, on, on, on public, uh, you know, platforms, uh, mentioning that the South African government must engage seriously with a government such as Zimbabwe, not only just Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Swaziland, or Eswatini, and, and the others, mm. uh, the DRC, Southern Africa, like I mentioned, to make sure that the, the governments in these, uh, you know, respective countries also uh, come to the party in terms of, you know, good governments, uh, democracy, uh, and ensuring that that uh, the rule of law is maintained to ensure that their citizens do not run away uh, to other countries. But having said that, uh, we also have to remember that uh, South Africa's foreign policy is about ensuring that we have a better Africa, an Africa that is actually part and parcel of this South-South cooperation, whereby uh, you will be able to uh, accommodate people based on, you know, the, the human rights policy that the country upholds, but obviously making sure that it does not be, uh, overburden one country against the other. The, tomorrow, ten, five years down the line, ten years down the line, it might be South African citizens crossing over to another country, maybe Zimbabwe or Mozambique, to go for, for greener pastures. And the, the, the governments in the region have got to continue talking continually, in my view, mm -hmm. to deal with such issues. Professor, one last question. Is there perhaps, if we had to analyze, is there perhaps something else at a psychological level that doesn't allow African leaders to critique each other or call each other out when perhaps there are allegations of corruption? Is it something or somewhat of a betrayal of a consciousness as Africans that perhaps it's a Western concept to be labeling African leaders as corrupt? And so at no point will they be found to be isolating or criticizing another leader? Is it at that level perhaps that it seems as somewhat of a betrayal because it's a concept they assume came from the West that Africans cannot lead? By in front of human nature, uh, you know, is always a, a problem when it comes to matters such as this. If anyone that uh, you point a finger to is obviously going to be to adopt a, a defensive posture. And African leaders are not an exception in this regard. What they uh, actually do not like is for uh, their counterparts to stand on the podium and use a megaphone and say, country X or country leader X, you are wrong. You are not de doing things the right way. They want things to be done behind the scenes, which is what has been happening so far. And uh, in fact, even South Africa's foreign policy allows that route. Uh, you know, quiet engagement, you call it quiet diplomacy, some call it, uh, you know, different things. However, having said that, even when they are uh, uh, behind the scenes, my view is that they've got to iron, the, the hard issues must come out irrespective of whether somebody is standing on a, part, on a public platform uh, or it is, uh, is doing this behind the scenes. So it, on, on the one hand, it is a, you know, that human nature, inclination whereby people do not necessarily want to be criticized. But on the other hand, they also, as African leaders, normally adopt this trade union mentality of uh, ganging up together uh, and to protect you know, um, the, the one person among themselves who might be having uh, you know, issues. We will remember the situation around
around you know uh, um, the former president al bashir who is now facing you know these charges around human rights abuses in in sudan what they do is is is, is, is gang around together and say well you know not, there's nothing wrong that this leader is doing. But behind the scenes, they do acknowledge that, no, but you have got to sort out, you know, issues in your country. So therein lies the fourth line. The, but my view is that if they could do this, even behind the scenes, but make sure that they produce the goods, make sure that they deal with the hard issues. This migration issue is not going to go away, and this migration issue is going to be a pain in the in 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 in, in, in not only in 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 the region. Ray Peary talked about you know the, this great river of pain in in one of his songs. And the Limpopo cannot continue to be a, a, in this uh, you know great river of pain uh, for both sides. Uh, it can actually be a river that is going to bring about happiness and you know a good bilateral relations between countries, not just uh, you know Zimbabwe and, uh, and 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 South Africa, but other countries that are sharing this international waterway. But having said that, it is also a question of dealing with the nuts and bolts. Who pays for the health costs of your citizens when they cross to the other side illegally? And we, you call them undocumented. In other areas, they call them just the simple illegal immigrants. And they want to, you know, um, 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 gather them together in a van and, and deport them. And they continue doing that. There's some other countries in South Africa are doing that. But is this, the, is this the solution? For me, it's not sustainable. Let us look at countries such as, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the Schengen countries. I'm talking about countries like France, Germany, uh, um, uh, Spain, and so on, which, which allow their citizens free movement across their you know, different territories. But obviously, they know that if your citizen gets sick here in South Africa and you came from, let's say, Malawi or you came from Mozambique, what portion of amount do you pay? What, 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 what you know, costs do you uh, uh, contribute to to ensure that the other country, the receiving country in this case, is not overburdened? And therein, for me, lies, you know, the discussion. It is not about whether South Africa is, is, is xenophobic or this as in MEC is xenophobic as uh, she is been, uh, she's under fire right now uh, for being xenophobic. But it is actually what I call real politics to make sure that you, 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 you deal with the issues as they are. Take the bull by the horns and call a spade a spade. The spade in this regard are the costs, implications of people who move from one you know, territory to another, one country to the other, without necessarily paying for the, for, for the services, whether today it's health, tomorrow it might be school, the other time it's going to be uh, something else, trade and so on. We have to make sure that the spin-offs that these countries mm -hmm. are having uh, you know, are, 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 are spread across all the Sadek countries, uh, because in this case it is Sadek, but it, it, is, it can even ap ap apply to other countries, you know, um, far afield, as far afield as Ethiopia, Senegal, Nigeria. There are Nigerians here and, and you know, West Africans who are also constantly coming in here, you know, to use the, the, the um, uh, health and, and other facilities. The African continent, the African Union, in my view, has a discussion that is not taking place, or at least not taking place as frankly as possible. All right. Let's hope, Professor, that leaders will take charge of the situation and start addressing the issues at a higher level than that of yours and mine. Thank you.